We might be consistent, we might follow plans, and our running might be progressing, but there are always extra little bits and pieces we can do to help us become faster runners. What is up guys, Andy Forrest Team Runner here. Welcome back to another video, and today I wanna to go through some training tips that I've learned that might help you guys become faster runners. So it's the little things that if they can become habit can really make such a difference to our running. Over the years I've picked up a few bits and pieces that I've definitely learned inside of training and just outside of training. Little things that can really help me step up to the next level. The consistency needs to be there, the training needs to be there and we need to be progressing as runners but the little extra things can really help us take another step towards our long term goals of becoming stronger and faster runners. So if you're excited for today's video guys make sure you give it a like, share it with your friends, subscribe to the channel for weekly running content we're going to dive right in. So just before we dive into the tips I just want to make it very clear that this is a video targeted towards the people that are looking to take the next step in running or people that are looking to continually progress maybe become faster stronger looking to break their pbs and want to set themselves a little challenge. People that are perhaps training loving training are progressing but know that there's those little extra bits and pieces that can be done in and around the outside within training and around the outside that can really help propel them forward over the coming months and years. So with that out of the way as well, let's have tip number one. So the first thing I want to mention is adding four by 30 seconds onto the end of some of your workouts, some of your faster, shorter workouts. Doesn't apply to all of them, but if you're doing shorter, sharper intervals, then putting these short bordering strides but maybe a little bit more of a controlled effort in obviously with strides we kind of accelerate through the motions with strides we maybe start at like sort of 60 70 percent and get up to 90 95 percent towards the end of the stride and maybe do 10 to 20 seconds but these 30 second efforts are more controlled from start to finish we're running at a faster pace and the goal is to turn the legs over quicker than the previous intervals that we've been running so let's say we've been doing one minute intervals two minute intervals three minute intervals kilometer repeats and sticking four by 30 seconds on at the end really helps turn the lengths over. My previous coach to what I have now used to put them in my workouts. I used to get sort of like, oh, do I have to do these? But then over time, I really understood the benefit of them. And Will, my current coach, also does them. There's a reason both these coaches do them and lots of other coaches give them to their athletes. And it is indeed to make them work hard on tired legs and get those legs turning over faster. These need to be just kind of quick, short, sharp efforts without breaking the bank, without really putting an enormous amount of effort in there because 30 seconds isn't a, a massive, amount of time but it is a, a time really to be able to spin the legs nice and fast and again it teaches your body to pick things up when it's tired at the end of that race when you're looking for that sprint finish when you're looking for that bit extra these are really helpful and the second point I want to mention is all about gear changing or cutting down in a workout and it all revolves around pace changes getting your body adapted and used to having to shift gears having to put a bit of a surge in again all things we're going to encounter within a race so examples might be things like you and myself might be training for a 10k or a half marathon and we might permanently week in week out be doing 10k or half marathon repeats uh, intervals at those paces I should say and our body's getting really used to that pace and it's really good it gets us a at that pace and that effort level and it's fantastic that effort that we put in for those intervals becomes second nature what happens in a race then if you need to surge what happens in a race if the pack breaks up and you want to go with them how is it going to be much more of a shock to your body if you've been practicing that in training no it's still if you haven't been practicing it in training yes so if you do things like what I've been doing recently with Will in particular, where I've been doing like a 2K tempo start, uh, and that's a tempo effort, and then I might go into some sets of intervals. So I might do four by 400 and two by 200. Will might prescribe me something like 400 meter repeats at 5K pace, 200 meter repeats at 3K pace. And I might do four of those, two of those, and then once I've done the two 200 meters at 3K pace, go back round, and do that again, repeat the cycle, another four by 400, another two by 200. And then effectively what I've done there is practice my 5K effort, and then I've gone, I need to put in a bit of a surge here, I need to really up my game, put in some 3K pace intervals. But then I need to be able to teach my body to settle back into 5K pace, and that is the hardest bit, getting your body back into running fast, not as fast as you were, but being able to teach your body that it's okay to surge, but then settle back in to that pace. And then right at the end, put in another shift where you're trying to up things up to the 3K pace. That is just an example. There's plenty of other uh, 
gear changing, cutting down pyramid workouts, the fart leg workouts that we can do to help us go through the gears. It's just going to enable us to be prepared within a race for any situation that might happen. We're sitting comfortably in a pack and then boom, the pack breaks, off they go. Do I want to go with them? How's this effort level? Can I go? Can I do a bit of a surge? Can I put in 30 seconds? Yes, I can. I've done it in training. Let's see if they settle down after 30 seconds. If they don't, that's fine. I'll settle back down. I'll let them go. But if they settle back down, I've covered their move. I've made them realize that actually you can't break me quite that easily. It's all that mental mind game. So practicing these stuff in training is really, really good. And tip number three is to mix up the terrain that you are running on during your training block. Now this can be for different reasons. It could be onto trails, it could be onto roads, but I'm more talking sort of like rolling undulating roads or trails, flat roads or trails and really hilly stuff. It really depends on what you're training for, but it's good to put a variety of these things in. It's good to put some undulating roads into your flat training, uh, mainly because it, again, it's gonna build strength. Whether you wanna do that in your easy runs or you wanna be doing some fartlek workouts and take them to the undulating roads, that's fine or trails, whatever it might be, just not permanently running on trails, not permanently running on undulating and not permanently running on flat, again, is gonna give your body that different stimulus. Just like in, um, in the tip number two, it's all about adapting to what we could face in a race. Ultimately, we love to, well, some of us, including myself, love to hunt out those fast, flat races, but there's usually some kind of incline, there's usually some kind of hills in a lot of the other races we do within a year. So by practicing on a variety of terrain is really gonna help us. Now, for example, what I've personally learned over the last couple of years is it's great to take intervals out onto the trail if I've got trails available, and that's great and fantastic, but I've gotta look at the adaptations I'm gonna get from those sessions and where I should best do them. So if I'm now doing interval work, like really short, sharp interval work, it is something that I would consider doing on the roads, even though, I've got the trails right on my doorstep. In years gone by, I would have used the trails uh, just because I can and I love to, but ultimately I know I'm gonna get a better benefit out on the roads. I'm gonna be able to turn the legs over faster on the roads and I'm gonna get that same stimulus that I'm gonna get in road racing and it's gonna callous the legs nicely. Um, but ultimately, if I'm doing a tempo run, it's, it's perfectly okay for me to take that out onto the trails and just work based on effort rather than pace because ultimately that then is gonna teach me to be running at that effort level, but throw in some inclines, throw in some, not massive hills, but throw in whatever it might throw at me, downs, ups, flats, you name it. It's really good to chop and change these things up. And tip number four is gonna all be about foot strength. And as you've probably gathered with some of the previous tips, it's all about kind of building mental strength and physical strength. Well, this tip is no different. Don't always run in high stack shoes. Do invest in some lower stack shoes with some good ground contact feel, if you can, uh, so that in some of your workouts, you can really make sure that you are doing all of the work rather than the shoes giving you the aid. So for me, what I like to try and do personally is just once a week on my shorter, sharper interval sessions, use a lower stack shoe. At the moment, the preference is the streak fly. It's meant to be a five and 10K racer. It is my favorite running shoe for shorter, sharper intervals. And I do all of the work. And what sometimes can happen with this is, well, first of all, you've got to let the ego get out of the room. It's just going to be a run where you are doing everything because ultimately, if I've been doing, which has happened recently, an interval workout uh, on like a Monday, and then if I do a more 10K specific session on a Wednesday, and I'm trying to hit certain 10K paces, I might use a higher stack shoe and something a little bit more efficient in that workout. But on the Monday one, I'm using a shoe where I'm doing everything. And sometimes what I can find is the paces aren't too dissimilar from either of the two workouts. Bearing in mind that I'm trying to really go top end here and I'm trying to hold a more controlled effort, but actually I can hold an easier controlled effort at a faster pace in more efficient shoes than I can in a shoe that I'm going to be uh, basically doing all of the work in. So I often come away from those Monday sessions feeling really accomplished, but going, oh, the paces weren't that good. But I'm telling myself, no, the paces are good. You've put everything into that. You've done all of the work. All you've had is, I don't know, 18, 20 mil of stack in the forefoot, uh, which really isn't a lot. And I've felt every step of the road uh, without a plate in it. And I've put everything in it. On the Wednesday, I can go out there and be a, feel a lot more cruisy because I've got a shoe that's got a bigger wedge of foam in there, making me more efficient, make, making me turn over nicely. And so having that lower stack shoe helps build up the strength that I think we lose personally when we're permanently running in those higher stack shoes. So again, talking about those first few points all about strength building, this is now more mechanically building up our foot strength, making sure that our bodies are doing a lot of the work. Yes, our legs get beaten up a bit more. We just have to take the right recovery steps, but it's so worth it in the long run. 
And these last two points, this is number five, but these last two points really are outside of running and can really help. And for me, it's activations, activations. So my routine uh, normally goes something like when I wake up, I go activations, I go and do a warm up if I'm doing a workout. So let's pretend I'm doing a workout, activations, warm up, workout, uh, cool down, get home, do some stretching. And then later that evening, I'll do some mobility work and maybe strength and conditioning if it's on the cards for that day. So for me, that's my routine and mobility work, uh, sorry, not mobility work, activations have been absolutely key for me to go out there in the mornings and feel really, really good. Now, I'm not gonna list all of the activations I do, but I'll give you a few, I'll throw a few out there. I do some squats, I do some lunges, forward, back, side to side, uh, just sort of five to 10 squats just to fire up the glutes. I do some monster walks with a resistance band, literally just 10 of them. I don't wanna do a full strength, like a full workout, fatigue everything, but I wanna make sure everything's firing. Do some glute bridges and finally, I call them bird dogs. And I've heard a lot of people call them that, but other people have different names. It's when you're on all fours and your opposite arm and leg go out like Superman and then you pull them back in and then you do the other side. Um, you do 10 of those on one side and then 10 of them on the other. And basically what that's doing is getting your back chain all fired up, that line of muscles from the right hand arm all the way down the back, crossing over the hip and then the left hand leg, all firing. Now for me, having every muscle that has gone lazy, uh, wake up and be ready to run is crucial because what I can find is when I start and take my first few steps in my run, they feel great. If I don't do any activations, it can take me five or 10 minutes to really get into my run. I feel sluggish, lazy, because those lazy muscles that I haven't woken up during the activations uh, are still being lazy and they need a bit of a kick to get into gear. So after five, 10 minutes, I kind of feel okay, but I often find that if I just get my activations done first, it's injury prevention, and secondly, it means I can start my run feeling good and fresh. And the final thing I wanna mention, point number six, is all about mobility. I just touched on it then, and oh my goodness, this is a game changer. So for so many of you out there, you're gonna be laughing at me because I'm relatively new to the mobility work. I have been doing it in the past a lot, but I've been doing it so much more over the last 12 weeks. In fact, this Sunday is gonna mark 12 weeks since I've been doing a strength and conditioning three times a week program, basically, and that has thrown in some mobility work too. I'm not gonna go into all the mobility work now because what I want to do is in to maybe a month or two when I've done like three months, three full months of work or even four full months of work or five or six, I don't know yet. I wanna do a comparison as to how my body was before I started this strength and conditioning and mobility work as to as it is now. And I tell you what, simple for me, hip, glute and back mobility work is an absolute game changer. The flexibility I now have is beyond anything I could have imagined 12 weeks ago. I didn't think my body had it in me, but just committing and dedicating the time to it, and it makes my running so much easier. I just watched my recent drills and strides and my high knees, my knee is coming so much higher up than it ever did in previous weeks. And I can't tell you, having a loose hips, uh, how much of a difference that makes to my running form. I'm much more up on my toes, midfoot toes rather than midfoot and heel. Um, I feel like I'm flowing so much better. And mobility work again is just great for sorting out the tight knots because ultimately a lot of injuries can come from tight muscles and come, come you know, it doesn't necessarily have to be a stress fracture or a, a torn muscle that an injury uh, can come from. It can simply be muscle knots and then that can manifest into other things. So if you get a knot in your calf, that might tighten up, go into your hamstring, glute, and suddenly your glute might stop working, and then you might just kind of pull the glute muscle or something, and that might all have stemmed from a muscle knot in the calf. These things can happen, but this mobility work and stretching, it all prevents that, and it is just an absolute game changer. So I will be doing a full video on that sort of thing over the next couple of months, but just trust me, mobility work is a godsend. And this is where you guys come in. I'd love to hear your thoughts on the tips that I've given and also what can you offer other people that have really been specific things you've changed in your running inside or outside of running itself that have made a massive difference. Obviously, I haven't included eight hour plus sleep a night. I haven't included drills and strides. I haven't included different types of runs, tempos, intervals, threshold runs, all of that sort of stuff. I feel like I've covered a lot of that in previous videos. I never really talk about the sleep, but that's because I have kids and four hours was the amount of sleep I got last night. So. 
yeah, that's a challenging one for me to sort out. But ultimately, I have to say, I've really tried to home in here specifically on certain elements that I feel have made such a massive difference to my running over the years. So yeah, this is where you come in. I'd love to hear in the comments below what you think about the tips, what you can recommend to other people. I'd love the comments section to become a good hub for people to go and check out and read other things because hopefully not only will they get these tips that I've offered, but hopefully some extra things from you guys as well. So that's it from me today, guys. I hope you enjoyed the video. And if you did, please do give it a like, share it with your friends, subscribe to the channel for weekly running content. And as always, I'll see you in the next one. Until then.